It is my pleasure to introduce two very, I, I consider them just wonderful people. Frank, who has been pushing for approval voting for God knows how long. And uh, sitting next to him is Blake Huber. Huber. Um, and they will be doing a presentation today on uh, approval voting as well as other voting methods. We will also be discussing, um, I hope we'll be discussing, uh, Kenneth Arrow's uh, impossibility theorem. We'll, we'll touch on that and uh, related items. With that, it is my great pleasure to uh, present uh, Frank Atwood and Blake Huber. And, did I get that right, Blake? Huber, yes. Huber. Um, will be um, our guest speakers today. Thank you so very much. Go ahead. Very good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name again is Blake Huber. Frank and I actually ran for president and vice president here in Colorado on the approval voting party ticket. So it's my thanks to Frank to pulling me into this. Frank's been doing this, I think, about eight years. I met him about a year after I started, but I was working at the time. So now that I'm retired, I'm working with him full time. And approval voting is a very, very interesting and simple concept. Frank is going to go into a lot of detail and kind of into the weeds. I like to keep things light and airy. And what I'd like to start off with is a quick introduction to alternative voting methods, aside from what we currently have. So just to start into it, our current method allows you to vote for one and only one person. Okay? So you have to think about everything you feel about the candidates, the issues, the election. You have to think strategically. If I vote one way, how's this going to affect other things? All of those things are wrapped up in your choose one plurality system. And you have to express yourself, everything you think about the election, in this one single precious vote. Uh, different systems, there are popular alternatives. There's ranking, there's rating, and there's approval. And just so that we're all on the same page before Frank gets into the really nitty gritty of the different voting systems or into approval voting, uh, I'm going to give you an introduction. So first of all, ranking is very simple. You simply take each candidate and you say, I like this person number one. Of all the candidates, I like them the best. I like this person number two. Almost number one, but I like them number two. Three, four, and five I hate, so they're, they're there, but I have to figure out what I'm ranking, so I rank them three, four, and five. One of the difficulties for me with ranking is how do you differentiate between the ones you truly like and the ones you truly hate. Now you can express yourself, you like this one better than this one, this one better than this one, these, you can test this one more than this one, etc. But there's a gap, and you can't express yourself where the gap is when you rank them. Okay? There's also costs involved with ranking. We'll get into that a little bit later. With, the, with rating, you simply assign a score to each candidate. So this one, again, my first choice rates number five. My second choice, you know, I can also almost rate them a five. In fact, I will. So the first two are both fives. And you're not taking anything away from each other. Both are fives. The rest you rate three, two, zero, whatever you like. So in my example, the first two would be four, or four and a half and five, and the rest would be zero. So in the first example with ranking, I call that one, two, three voting. In the second example, I, uh, example with rating, I call that rating, scoring, or Olympic judging. Okay? There's also additional cost to rating as there is to ranking over our current system. Now the last one, the last system that's popular as an alternative method is approval voting. So instead of rating, instead of ranking, you simply mark the ones you like, the ones that you identify with on the issues, the ones that represent your principles. You mark the ones you like, ignore the ones you don't, and the person, the, the one that has the broadest popular support, the candidate has the broadest popular support, or has the most votes, is the one that is elected. So it becomes less of a winner-take-all, or I won and you lost, it's more of a Hmm. Well, this person has the broadest popular support. So, of course, they should be the one that leads us. Now, in a, in a small group, like a club, if you're electing a president, 
and the accountant is the one that you actually elect as president, and the runner-up is a, uh, a nurse, okay? And she gets, it's like 50, 51, 52 percent of the vote, 49, 48 percent of the vote. So it's not a winner-take-all system. The person has the broadest popular support, the accountant gets installed as president. And when tax time comes, the accountant says, you know, I have to resign for a few months. So do you have another election or just install the person, have the second most uh, popular support, the nurse? And she takes over for a period of time, then they flip it back. It makes things so much simpler. Approval voting is used, and Frank will go into this in more detail. I'll just touch on it briefly. It's used by organizations like the United Nations. I'm not a fan of the United Nations, but think of what they purport to do. They purport to bring people together. So if they're using approval voting, they truly want to have broadest popular support. They want to bring people together instead of divide them into factions. I also understand, I don't have proof of this, but I understand the Pope is elected by approval voting. Again, this is a group that wants to bring people together instead of split them into factions. So let me sum up by saying that of the alternative methods, they're all much better than what we currently have where you can only choose one. Because you can truly express yourself. You can say, uh, this person is best, this person is second, this person is third, or you can rate them saying that well, I really like these two best. I like this one third, but it's a group decision. So it's whoever has the broadest popular support. And then approval voting is whoever actually has the broadest popular support is the one that is elected. It's as simple as that. Now let's talk up briefly about cost, and then I'm going to turn it over to Frank. With ranking and with rating, you have to devise a system where the ballots will be counted, and you'll have a secure way of counting them. And Frank, are you going to talk about ranked? Um, no. Okay. So in ranking, um, there's a way to vote. If you vote strategically in ranking, the person you vote for may not be the one that wins. There's ways to do it. I'm not going to get into all the details. But if you go Google IRV, instant runoff voting, versus approval voting, IRV versus approval voting, you'll find a wonderful a demonstration of how that works and how the person you don't want to get elected can win. Some people said, don't agree with them, but some people said under IRV we can elect a Hitler. Okay? But let's take just look at the cost. The cost is you have to have a way to count the ballots, you have to wait to finagle them in such a way they have to be counted at a central office because you have to have all the ballots together. The least ballots is eliminated, then least ballots is eliminated on the second round, least ballots is eliminated on the third round and then you get to, you finally get to a winner, okay? With rating, it's not as bad, but there's still additional costs. With approval voting, we've checked with the voting machine manufacturers and city and county clerks, and they say there's no additional cost for the election. Of course, there's going to be some costs involved in educating people to let them know, yes, you can vote for more than one, it's okay. Each vote stands alone. And you're not going to betray your favorite. You'll never betray your favorite by voting for one, by voting for more than one. One last thing I'd like to say about approval voting is I call this conscience voting. So you can vote your conscience. You can vote strategically and you can vote your conscience. So thanks for your time. And I'll turn it over to Frank. Thank you, Blake, very much for that summary. And what I'm going to do is be grateful for Celeste Landry having presented uh, already uh, previously doing a PowerPoint for League of Women Voters. And, and we'll go through that fairly rapidly and then we'll start getting into the weeds as I understand people wanting to hear the weeds. So uh, Celeste is not advocating support of approval voting is how I'm going to state that. Or The League of Women Voters is advocating more on the ground experimentation of alternative voting methods. Yes. And that's that's where we're headed right now with the approval voting effort. Um, on the next page, uh, what are the voting methods? 
Uh, a voting method is defined as the form of the ballot, what constitutes a ballot vote, and how to play. Of course. Okay. A voting method is not to be confused with an election system, which is concerned with whether or not to have a early voting all mail election or paper ballot. Thank you, Celeste, for making the distinction. Sometimes I get. Uh, Page down. Thank you, Celeste. <laughs> so, uh, what, what I'm focusing on is alternative voting methods, and primarily the three that you were currently hearing from most people are uh, plurality voting, approval voting, score voting, which is like Olympic judging and instant runoff voting. On the next page here, let's say there were, in addition to brownies, there was chocolate cake. You could believe if you wanted to that the chocolate cake was being used as a sabotage element to brownies. <laughs> to split the chocolate vote. You know, you, you, can't, you can't let those chocolate people um, dominate. And the chocolate cake here would... Um, to back up for just a second, Frank, the people who like chocolate. For the people who like chocolate, yes. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, desirable attributes, uh, favorite safe, clone safe, adding voters only helps your candidate you're glad you voted, and you'd be happier rather than not. So I'm not that well versed on this, but I'm, if Celeste wants to go into it, feel free to. So there are different kinds of desirable attributes for any voting method. These are the tactical ones. So you want your favorite, you want to be able to vote for your favorite and not hurt your favorite by voting for your favorite. You, you want to, um, clone safe means if there's more than one that are the same. So for instance, Trump was very different from the other candidates. You might have called the others clones. Uh, you know, but they could all, they had to split the vote. So it, they, it, that was not a, plurality is not a clone safe uh, type. And then there's some other, adding votes only helps your candidate in math, we call that a monotonic system. You're glad you voted. There's some voting systems where, voting methods where you prefer you hadn't voted. And this is the getting into the aspects. And then there's uh, desirable at attributes number two, voter turnout. Um, what especially for libertarians, we want a nursery for third parties or lesser known alternatives uh, conducive to positive campaigning and candidates preferred by the most most voters. Why I push for approval voting. Uh, desirable attributes number three, implementation, can use existing machines, simpler for voters, precinct countable, not relevant in Colorado, minimal ballot spoilage. With regards to precinct countable, here in Colorado, we're now focused on county countable, where at the county level it's, it's countable, but you may not have specific precinct information from that, um, from those, those voters. Do you, do you want questions now? Or sure, you? go ahead. So, but even if you don't care about precinct countable, you care about batch countable and you care about county countable. So it's the same, it's all the same, right? Yes, completely so. so. You care about countability. And, and, and that's what I'd aggregate. What I'd like uh, the both plurality voting that we currently have is batch. You can batch it. You can batch and uh, Olympic judging, you can vote batch approval voting. You cannot batch instant runoff voting. Instant runoff voting has to be fully consolidated and then proceed with the actual accounting of it. And to add what Frank is talking about, in my opinion, I believe Frank's as well, the smaller the group that counts the votes, the less fraud you can have. It'll encourage less fraud. The larger the group, 
then any fraud that you engage in will have less of a blip and you can be more, it'll be more hidden, okay? It's like crime in a big city, less known, crime in a small town, everybody knows it. So the smaller the group that actually counts the votes the best. Um, next page of website resources is approval, approval voting. I um, is Center for Election Science. I listen to um, often it's said that you need three aspects to a political movement. You need the intellectuals, you need the administrators, and you need the activists. And I'm letting the uh, Center for Election Science be my approval voting intellectuals. A center for range so, vote. Um, we should, for full disclosure. Yes. <laughs> uh, Neil McBurnett, who's here, is a board member. Board member of, of Center for Election Science. Oh, you're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Celeste, for trying to keep me honest. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. A score voting, it primarily comes out of Warren. Warren D. Smith, who is in Long Island, and uh, then instant runoff voting is fair vote and also, um, uh, whose name am I? Rob, Rob Ritchie. Ritchie. Rob Ritchie. <laughs> okay. Approval voting in, used in Colorado, CU student government is using it. Uh, Representative Singer is carrying a bill this uh, January. And uh, I'm pushing it at the uh, election commission level at a home rule city of Littleton. Instant runoff voting uh, has, has more history. I tell people I fell asleep and let it voting get uh, a half, half century head start on me. Uh, we're trying to catch up with it. Examples of um, we won't go into examples of voting methods for single seat elections here. Uh, I'm hoping you all understand the different methods. So just one thing about instant runoff voting. There have been cases where it's been implemented and then rejected, um, or where it's been put on the ballot as in Fort Collins and rejected. Um, it hasn't been used very much in Colorado, but it is allowed by state statute to be used. We don't have to do anything more to get permission to use instant runoff voting. That's true in municipal elections, but yeah. not statewide. Okay, so right now, um, it's been on the books for approximately eight years, and only a few cities have used it. Aspen used it several years ago and then rejected it because there was a flaw in the algorithm counting the votes. This was not intentional fraud, but it was a form. It's like you got a thousand extra dollars in your bank account and you don't know where it came from. And that's how it happened in Aspen. The story is, and I don't know if this is true, and please don't repeat this until, <laughs> until I can fact check it, but I understand from somebody who is involved in the election in Aspen that the story that she told me is some kid in New Jersey in his mother's basement created this algorithm of counting the IRV votes in Aspen and that's why it failed. So why do we, my question then would be, why do we trust, put so much faith and trust into a system that can be corrupted so easily? I'd much rather 10 people get together and count votes and you have an audit trail where you can go back and count them again if you need to. With approval voting, and. I can let you right back in here, Frank. But with approval voting, you don't have any hanging chads, okay? If you overvote, if you mark more than one, it's quite permissible. And the last thing I'll say in, in addressing your question is, in the legislature next year, we're introducing legislation, we hope to, we should be able to, that will then require the Secretary of State to create rules surrounding how approval voting can be used in an election. If any city, any uh, municipality, county, or even if the state wants to use it, we'll have rules on how that election can be run. I'm 
now going to go to uh, my. Greg yes. Has a question. Yes, Greg. I just wondered uh, what representative was that? Was that Balmer or Singer it, that was going to bring the legislation? Uh, representative Singer, Jonathan oh. Singer oh. from uh, near Longmont. Yes. And there also might be a senator as a co sponsor. We're, we're trying to. I'm not going to mention any names because okay. that could kill the deal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, it was on the screen. <laughs> That was a previous senator. That was senator previous Palmer. Senator Palmer. Uh, right, right. Was very senator Palmer good. has retired. Right. right. So the screen is a few years old. Um, By okay. the way, I want to compliment everybody on questions you're asking as we go along. I prefer to have it a participatory thing, and I think Frank does too. Yes. But it's much more important that we understand what we're dealing with as we deal with it rather than waiting till the end. So, I, I'd like to, so one thing um, is that approval voting is just a very simplified form of score voting. So approval voting is actually also a rating voting method. Yes. But and you're correct. Rating yes, no, one, zero. Yes. It's that simple. Yes. yes. And what we like to do, and you can see on our shirts, okay, uh, mark the ballots, yay or nay. Oh, by the way, we didn't design this to, to be having both the same shirt on, just happened to be. But you vote all the candidates yay or nay. Mark the yays, ignore the nays. Whoever has the broadest or most votes, most yays, is the one that's elected. It's that simple. Okay. Have, how many, who has missed my arguments for approval voting? Because we can go through the list here. Let's uh, go through the list, Frank, for okay. people who are going to be listening to this on uh, Certainly. YouTube. Certainly. Okay. Um, arguments for approval voting. With regards to the established parties, fewer spoilers and less sabotage, minimizing faction sabotaging their philosophical allies. This would be oh. applicable both... I'm sorry, is, is what you're reading on... No. 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 Okay. This... All right. This Fine. is handouts, not, not screen. Okay. And I'll... When I edit this, what I'll do is I'll attempt to get, I'll, I'll want you to send me a copy of this electronic so that I can uh, put this up on the screen Certainly. for people. Go ahead, okay. Frank. I apologize. No problem. Um, if, I'll go to the second, a second point for alternative parties, more viability and visibility. Also known for libertarians, we move above the noise. When I first started think, looking into this, I said, you know, this will give libertarians an advantage. And then the question was, what, what's in it for the major parties? And for the major parties, it's fewer spoilers and less sabotage. What's a spoiler? A, a spoiler is the Ralph Nader traditionally of the 2000. I, yes, Bill? I've got one that uh, sure. somehow the systems you came up with don't include a parliamentary system. Proportional representation is what I think you're asking for. And my, I've sold my soul on two points. One is I consider here in the United States, single, single winner districts are going to be continued. To fight that paradigm is not going to be successful in my lifetime here in the United States. And to go to proportional representation means abandoning single district winners. And so even though proportional representation has more world global support, I don't see it changing here in the United States. Let me chime in on this. Sure. So if we look at Europe and we look at other places in the world, we find that multi-seat elections occurred because of some some uprising, some revolution. Um, something happened to cause something really big to happen. 200 years ago we had our own resolution. We decided on single single seat elections for almost all we've the found the best way to go, single seat. Someday we might go to multi-seat. But that's some off in the future. Approval voting and multi-seat uh, can work together. They can work together well, but that's not what we're advocating, and there are issues. 
just like there's issues with the other alternative methods, approval voting for single seat elections works well. Does anybody else have some insight on that? Well, I want to really support the notion that uh, a better voting system would be proportional representation, and that yes. actually it can be argued that something like Boulder City Council should have proportional representation, which we had via single transferable vote from 1917 to 1947. And I encourage everybody who's watching online and everybody here to Google single transferable vote. When I was in high school, back in the ninth and 10th grade, studying economics, I ran across STV and I loved it. Right. Okay. Can we get that implemented or can we get approval voting right. implemented? What do we want to put our money behind? Which type of a thing? I think approval voting has a much better chance of getting implemented over STV. My point is just that there are elections in which it should be very amenable. It has been in the past. And uh, but just for, for context for people, uh, the Canada is looking hard at alternative voting systems right now. They also have a single member district system. But there's a lot of pressure. And in fact, I think uh, one of the eastern provinces just um, expressed popular interest in something like that. So I, I wouldn't leave it out. But yes. for, for today, I think it's fine to to stick with the single winner problem. There's also something called re, re wakeable range voting that is probably better than single transferable vote if people want it. And again, with any type of a uh, multi winner, multi, I'm sorry, I don't like to use the word winner, any type of a multi, there are other methods. We're concentrating on what 99% of what we currently have is single winner or single seat elections. Now, there are some where you have um, you have multi seats, but they're, you're you're doing it at large, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about single seat elections. Once we see that an alternative method can catch on, we can then investigate other methods as well. <coughs> Any other questions? Moving, continuing down the list of arguments for approval voting. We come, third one is voters more honest with less anger and frustration when presented with a dilemma or in anyone but candidate, such as I feel both as evidenced by the Never Trumper movement and the anybody but Clinton movements that we've just witnessed. Candidates would be more civil and less polarization when avoiding antagonizing crossover voters. Uh, the candidate's going to focus on the issues. Friends stay friends when they use approval voting, which in a sense is a show of hands. When you're with friends doing a show of hands for a movie or a restaurant, you don't tell people you can only vote once. You let people vote more than once. Nationally less trauma when there are spoilers. Uh, when there are spoilers such as Nader in 2000 or a disapproved candidate, this most recent one. Simplicity, no additional costs, simply change the overvote threshold from seats to be filled to candidates running. For Does that need to be explained? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, currently, currently, if it's a single a single seat to be filled and you vote for two of the candidates, your, that, that portion of the ballot, ballot will be validated and, and um, because you voted and it's called an overvote when, because you voted for too many candidates. With regards to the simplicity of changing to approval voting instead of that overvote threshold being the one seat to be filled, it's now the number of candidates letting you, permitting you to vote for all the candidates you want to. Uh, the instructions would change from vote for one to vote for one or more candidates or, or possibly the instructions might be one seat to be filled vote for one or more than one candidate. Wasted vote argument. As libertarians, 
we confront the wasted vote argument so often. The question is, as dedicated libertarians, you come back with the response, my vote's never wasted when I vote my conscience and vote for it. Yes, for libertarians, that argument holds. For the other 96% of the voting population, no, it doesn't. They don't, they don't vote. They, they are concerned about wasting their vote. I'm going to let you take a breath for just a moment. One of the things about alternative parties <clears throat> and alternative parties getting recognition, and I really don't care if an alternative party ever wins. I don't care if a libertarian or green ever wins. But what I want to do is I want to reduce the concept of shame. So right now, if you're an independent and you run, why did Bernie Sanders not run as an Democrat? We engage, the populace engages in shaming. So if you don't run as an R or a D, shame on you for running as an independent. Shame on you as running as an alternative party candidate. Nobody's going to vote for you. You have no chance of winning. Shame on you. With approval. You can vote the establishment party if you want to, and you can throw some approval towards another candidate. And one of the things that Frank has already mentioned I'd like to amplify is, who's next? Okay? So if Mary is running as a mayoral candidate, she's 19 years old, a lot of good ideas, a lot of passion, a lot of fire, and she really could do a good job as mayor, but the banker Joe, who's in his 50s, is the sure, the sure winner, okay? So if Mary gets in and Joe wins with 50 or 60 or 70 percent of the vote, and Mary gets 30 to 40 percent approval, it's because, yeah, we're going to vote for Joe, he's a good guy, yeah, we want to get him elected, yeah, he'll do a good job. But Mary, we want her to run again next time. And when Joe's ready to retire, we think Mary will be the top contender. So you throw some approval her way. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? I know I'm interrupting what you're reading. <laughs> Blake's covered the shaming ar argument on it with regards to approval voting. Also, with approval voting, there's fresh ideas and candidates more likely to surface in the marketplace of political ideas, and there's less ballot spo spoilage. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry to go back to this shaming issue. If your vote is truly secret, where is the shaming? I mean, who's being shamed? Is it the candidate yes. or is it the voter? The candidate. Both the candidate and the voter. Okay, so if you as a voter express yourself to have some feeling, good feeling about a Bernie Sanders who's an independent, people say, well, he doesn't have a chance to win as an independent. He should run as a Democrat. Shame on him for running as an independent. And my question to this group and to everybody watching is, why did Bernie run as a, uh, as a Democrat? Why did he run as an independent? He did not want to take votes away from his intellectual ally, Hillary. Had he run as a, an independent, he would have taken votes away from her under our current system. Uh, some people say he may have won. Uh, some people say he was a good candidate and he shouldn't have dropped out. He should have fought it right to the end. Some say he was cheated. With, approval, with an approval voting type system, you're not going to see that. And more than that, in, in direct relation to your question, he wouldn't be shamed. And the voter who voted for him wouldn't be shamed. Because if you voted for Bernie and Hillary, or Hillary and Bernie, what difference does it make under approval voting? If we look back at two when Clinton, Perot, and Bush were running, we can see that Perot got 19% of the choose one vote. Now, there's no way to go back that far back and do a study to find out would you have had crossover votes? Would Perot people vote for Bush? Would Bush people vote for Perot? My feeling is there would have been a several, okay? And in that case, Clinton may not have won, that Bush or Perot would have won. Probably would have been Bush winning and Perot coming in second and Clinton coming in third on approval. There's no way to back that up. There's no way to prove that. Now, right now, the Center for Election Science is doing a study. Um, 
they've just released the first part of their study so go to electology.org you're going to click on a blog post that says smart voting and you're going to find a lot of information about how approval voting in this last election have they been able to do a study on individuals and we do have some information I think it's going to be in the description of the YouTube video uh, the uh, the important thing there is we can now see that in this election there would have been much larger support for alternative candidates than we see the one and three percent we currently see you get enough to eat there Frank? yes okay I'm trying to help the website for Center for Electology has the article Smarter Elections 2016 Approval Voting Versus Plurality and in it there'll be a, a table that shows with our current plurality system uh, Gary Johnson got 3% and with approval voting when they polled more than a thousand people he would have gotten uh, 21 percent, sevenfold wow. response for uh, one in response to the wasted vote argument, also in response to the to the shaming question of did he steal votes away from either Clinton or uh, Trump? And, and if you get above a certain threshold, they let you participate in the presidential. Debates. Of course, they may change the rules. Right. Before. But but at least the presence is there thanks to approval voting. And this is the viability and visibility that I talk about with regard. Celeste brings up a great point. There were no approval voting polls done. Had there been approval voting polls done prior to the first debate, we would have seen more people in that debate. And they would have been it would have been clear that this person has 15 or 20 percent, this person has 20, 25 percent, it would have been clear that these people have a certain amount of support when people can truly um, express themselves at the ballot box. So if we don't get approval voting adopted by any state, we need to get the pollsters to adopt. Who do you approve of in this election? If you could vote for more than one, who would you vote for? That's a simple question to make a big difference towards future elections. And mentioned earlier, less spoilage with regards to ballots, because if you're allowed to vote for more than one, you, that will not invalidate the, the ballot as with overvoting. Do you mind if I give a quick example? No. Yes, I do. Okay. Okay. Right. We're going to okay, now move on to arguments against approval voting. Approval voting will negate two-party dominance. That argument comes from Ryan Call. Anybody here recognize Former state, state chair of the Republican Party. He recognizes that I feel it's a mentality wondering why they're letting in foreign cars to compete with them and he he does not want to see the playing field level but that's my opinion about Ryan Paul also uh, ties may be less rare now with Ralph here um, his Ralph's concern as I remember it is that with approval voting there'll be there'll be an accurate number for what the libertarian support might be and it might be far less than what they currently think we might have and that the they meaning the major parties would have less respect for the libertarians with approval voting because they now know that be able to say you're you're more of a um, fringe more of a fringe element. I feel Gary Johnson getting 20%. You can still label him a fringe element, but at least at 20% he's worth, um, he's on, on the field. Um, Ava 
is concerned about counting the votes when I talk with the uh, Ava, Ava um, or Ava, Eva. Eva. Eva, sorry, Kaczynski. I'm sorry. Eva Kaczynski is concerned about the mechanics of counting the vote. When I talk with clerk and recorder in Arapahoe County, he's not that. He's not concerned. He feels it'll be the same, uh, basic same method as we currently have, uh, and that their machines can handle it with no additional cost. And. Uh, from a campaign Republican campaign manager, his concern was that it makes controlling the outcome more difficult. And um, <laughs> in, which in my mind means that somebody besides the Republican or Democrats going to win. He, he wants life easy. He wants a two-party system. I'm sorry, I'm going to correct you, a two-party duopoly. Duopoly. So what we, we fight constantly against the concept of the monopoly. There are natural monopolies, there are government-supported monopolies, like utilities and telecommunications companies. But in, the, in every other aspect of our lives, we do not encourage monopolies. And our current system, our Choose One system, not only encourages monopolies, it incentivizes it. So under approval voting, each individual candidate, each party has to earn their vote. Just like I have to earn what I get paid by my employer. Just like my employer gets to earn what the business makes based on what people like about the product. So isn't that American to have to earn your support? And isn't our current system incentivizing not having to earn it but just getting it? And one other quick thing I'd like to say about what our current system does is it incentivizes bad actors. Now, this vote splitting thing, uh, Frank mentioned it. I think it really needs to be developed more in terms of how we think about it. Because right now, if Frank and I are running against each other, and let's say I'm a communist or a socialist, and Frank's a true diehard libertarian, and we really differ, and in our community, whatever that is, is we're splitting the vote half and half. Or let's say Frank is pro-bridge, wants to build a bridge across the river to get more business into the town. I'm anti-bridge because we're financing, we're mortgaging our children's future. So what happens is somebody comes in and hires somebody to go against me. Somebody that acts and talks and thinks like me. So if, if he's pro-bridge and I'm anti-bridge and you want to split the anti-bridge anti-bridge and then the pro-bridge people or the bridge builder who comes to town wants to finance the campaign of the anti-bridge interloper once we split the vote the pro-bridge vote wins and then the builder then gets to build the bridge does that make sense so in splitting a vote among intellectual allies the other person wins and so if somebody comes in as a communist runs against me as a communist then he's going to win now, he may not know anything about it, but we've, we've actually incentivized a bad actor to come in and hire somebody to split the vote so the, the vote that he doesn't want, okay, so that the one he does want wins. That's not illegal. It's immoral. And that's the biggest reason I'm for approval voting. And this ties back to Celeste's discussion of clones, that clones subvert the election process in our current system and and at this point I want to just get take questions yes uh, Celeste I don't mean to be putting you on the spot but do you want to um, explicate this uh, Frank's last statement about clones um. I thought I sort of did that when I talked about the non-Trump candidates. Trump is unique and the other candidates were not Trump and they split the vote and Trump so won the so various the clone primaries. Is a, the clone is not a clone of Trump, it's a clone of the other candidates. The other candidates. It's okay. the two anti-bridge candidates that Blake was talking about. But this is brilliant. We needed a Trump clone. That's what we needed. <laughs> so what's interesting is Republicans have told me 
that if they used approval voting in their primary, Trump would have been number eight. It would have been the top three, Kasich, Rubio, and Cruz would have been duking it out, okay? But the broadest popular support probably would have been those one of those three. And Trump would have been about number eight. Because he doesn't have broad popular support. He has, we did, we actually did, do you want to talk about Western Conservative Summit? I'll pass. Okay. okay. So we actually did a study last year at the Western Conservative Summit where they actually did a comparison between approval voting and plurality voting. Everybody could vote for who should be, who should Trump choose as vice president. And a core group of very strong supporters for Newt Gingrich got him to win when you could choose only one. But when you had to choose as many as you like, double the number of people, double the number of ballots were marked for Ben Carson. So Ben Carson had broad popular support. Um, again, this is a conservative religious group. Uh, he had broad popular support where Newt Gingrich has a very tight cadre and all the other people, there were like 10 or 12 different candidates, yes. they split the vote when you could only vote for one and Newt won because of that. Now Newt had high, high negatives, so he wasn't very high up on the list of vote for all you like. Ben Carson was on more ballots. Yes, sir. I, I can see how this works well for that setting, like for nominations, sort of on the way up. Yes. Um, but let me see if this makes sense or this is fitting with the shaming thing. In the in the last election, the presidential election, the only candidate I could have voted for was Gary Johnson. I couldn't vote for any of the others. But even under approval voting, as I understand it, that wouldn't have lessened my vote if I just voted for one candidate. Not at all. Okay. You're Definitely. completely correct on that. Um, there, if, if on the contrary you had voted for everyone, then that does yes. dilute your vote, but it is, at the same time, it's a statement on your part saying, right. I'm supportive of everyone. Right. Well, it, it sort of gets away from the strategy, of, you know, the old thing, of, you know, you got to vote for Trump because otherwise you're voting for Clinton. And, and I, I was like, no, I can't deal with that. <laughs> I can only <laughs> vote for who I can vote for. But under approval voting, the point is that it doesn't dilute your vote if you just vote. How true. Okay. Very true. What's interesting is they did a study in France on that very topic back in 2008 or so. And what, what they found is it didn't matter that a majority or a, or a huge number of people voted approval voting. It just mattered that some did. Okay. So if enough people do, they can affect not only the election possibly, but future policy. So think about this. If you vote, if you bullet vote, that's what you did. You bullet voted for one candidate, okay? So if enough people who also voted for him voted for somebody else and the other person they voted for actually won, let's say, let's say it was Trump that they voted for and Gary Johnson that they voted for. So they voted for Trump because they thought lesser of two evils, got to vote for him, blah, blah, blah. And they also threw some approval Gary's way. That tells the winning candidate or the candidate that has the broadest popular support, dude, look at what other people are saying. Look at who else got support. These are the policies we want you to follow. We know you had all the money. We know you had all the votes. But the policies that are important to us are what this guy was saying. So I'd like to tag team onto that. Um, you were talking about arguments against approval voting. Yes. And there are two kinds of arguments against approval voting. One is just versus plurality voting, and one is versus other kinds of voting. So uh, the argument I've heard Rob Ritchie use when he compares IRV to approval voting is that too many people will just bullet vote. Um, and that's an option. You can always just vote for one. You don't have to vote for more than one if you don't want to. Um, and my understanding is that approval voting advocates say, that's okay. 
that's not an argument against it, and I noticed you did not write it as an argument against um, on your list. Right. <laughs> thank, thank you, Celeste. I'll incorporate that. Good thank feedback. You. Raise my hand. Um, yes. Yeah. Would you like to hear against approval voting? Yes. Yes, please. There's a wonderful book that I read many years ago called The New World of Economics. And it's a hard book to find. And one of the arguments they make in that book, and they, they were not talking about approval voting, they were talking about um, the economics of how candidates approach the uh, approach elections. A candidate who wishes to win uh, will take a position or positions which appeal to the greatest number of voters. So one argument for the current system, not that I'm saying that I approve of that of this system, but one argument for it is that you will cause candidates to go to the center. And you can see this um, in elections routinely. Um, during the primaries, the candidates tack to the left or right to, uh, to appeal to the greatest number of uh, voters who are Democrats or Republicans. And once they get the nomination, you can see them tack to the center. Uh, I don't think Trump did this, but nonetheless, that's uh, one argument for not having approval voting, because the opposite of that statement, which is that if you have um, a system that causes candidates to go to the center, you that in some senses is a public good. You want people to approve to be appealing. To the, uh, you want to appeal to the greatest number of people, and thus your policies will appeal to the greatest number of, of people. The problem, of course, is that once you get elected, you may not implement those policies, but there's a, uh, a prisoner's dilemma type of, a repeated uh, re prisoner's dilemma type of argument, which says, well, if you don't tack to the center, if you don't appeal to those voters as you ruled or as you were elected, then you won't win the next election. If you have approval voting or other systems, then there's much less, and I think this is a fair statement, there's much less reason for candidates to tack to the center. Whether that's good or not, I don't know. But if you wish to have a government that is not of extremists, perhaps that's the uh, uh, the right thing to do. I don't make a, a go ahead, Blake. What did you just say? If you don't want a government led you, by extremists, then you want our current system? Yes. You want so to what have we currently have, we currently have is a system that says, if I l sound like the other person running, then how do I differentiate myself from them? And in marketing, I want to differentiate myself extremely from my, my, my opponent. So if I'm a moderately right-wing person, I have to appeal to the far right wing to appeal to my to my core, and my opponent has to appeal to the left wing. So our current system drives us to the extremes. Think about, I'm not going to use that example. Um, I, I think that, uh, that let, argument is wrong. Let me suggest to you Okay. And I, I have mathematical proof, if you'd like to see it. Sure, go ahead. I don't have it with me. I can't, <laughs> I can't do it. But, but think of it this way. Would Ronald Reagan have won under any system? Was he popular enough? Did he appeal to the center or to the extreme? That's a, rhetor that that's a rhetorical question. In my impression, in my opinion, Ronald Reagan would have won under any system we could have devised because he had the broadest popular support. So what you're, what I hear you saying is, we don't want this muddy middle because we don't know what it's gonna be like, but yes, we do. We want the person who has the broadest popular support. We want the person that really gets the most people to the polls, the most people to vote for them, whether or not they're number one or not, okay? But right now, 
if you think about it, there are people who say, I don't have any proof to this, and I can't really say it myself, but there are people who say, Trump's not a Republican. He's just a Democrat that took on Republican ideas so that he could win. And it was all about winning. So our current system says, you must win. It's us versus them. We must bury you. And approval voting says, come on along. We want to see as the broadest popular support. And if you're concerned about people coming to the middle and not, not producing, that's the same as them on our current system going to the extremes and not producing and not doing what they say they're going to do. But if you had a Ford, you want a Ford that appeals to the most people. Ford wants to build a vehicle that appeals to the most people. They're going to find out what people want most. And yes, they're going to go to the middle because that's where their market is. Chevy's going to do the same thing. Jeep is going to do the same thing. It doesn't matter. So if, and I know I'm going on longer than I meant to, but if you have a brand, a Republican or Democrat brand, you want that brand to stand for something and you want to appeal to people who come to their brand rather than just appeal to the extremists. Is there a question? Yes, there's Neil Newport. Hold, oh, I'm hold, sorry. Hold for Frank. just a moment. I, I think I'm going to suggest, Ralph, that the initial positioning of candidates that we have in our current system requires to, to win. In order to win, you have to start at the extremes and then tacked into the center. What approval voting would permit is a candidate to begin in the center and continue in the center. And that's why I feel we as libertarians feel ourselves being squeezed out of the center. We're being squeezed by the religious right saying that we're too socially uh, tolerant and accepting. We're being squeezed by the, uh, the left, fiscally irresponsible, that we're fiscally, uh, fiscally tightwads. And we find ourselves, and this is Duverger's law, that says that when you have a single precious vote, it goes into a two-party system. And part of, part of my uh, page that shows the statistics for libertarians were noise of the noise. We're less than, uh, we were pleased this year to be getting 3%, and we've rarely gotten out of the 3%. And, and so I would suggest, Ralph, that it isn't that we, we currently witness the major parties positioning themselves to win the, their primaries and then tacking into the center. Wouldn't it be nice to have a candidate in the center who had a chance of positioning himself from the get-go? It's yes. going to be Neil and then it's going to be uh, Bill, but I, I want to take 15 sure. seconds. Um, with your permission, please. Uh, even without permission. Um, first of all, I don't want to say I'm in, I am a sponsor of the current system. Right. I simply was making some statements about counter arguments to pr approval voting. Okay, please don't ascribe it to me. Uh, it's ne uh, Neil and then Bill. Before we go to Neil and Bill, I just want to make one quick comment. Uh, currently, silent majority. With our current system, the majority has been silenced. Because what the system does is it attracts those people on the the extremes to come in and push for their candidate. If we have a moderate, middle-of-the-road candidate, people are going to get excited. They're going to want to go out and vote. I guess it's Neil's turn. Okay, Neil, Neil, and then Bill. Sure. Um, I, I I love approval voting. I think it's uh, the right direction to go. But I just want to list a couple other uh, issues and disadvantages. So. One that I hear from like people that I just talked to on the street or friends of mine or whatever, um, there are a lot of people that want to rank things. They, they don't ever want to have to say these two people are the same. They don't want to approve of two candidates because one of them really has their heartstrings and the other one is who they'll settle for. So there's a psychological resistance to being forced to either rank them the same or to just stick with your heartstrings and, once again, quote-unquote, waste your vote. 
So th that's kind of um, that's a an issue to consider. Um, something that's very important for that's necessary for approval voting and actually necessary for most any polling uh, voting system is useful polling ahead of time. You want to know who you might want to compromise for who actually has a chance to win. And so um, that's something to recognize that's con sometimes considered a problem for approval voting. If you were voting in a local election, you might really have no idea where to draw your line, who has a chance of winning that you should support. But uh, it kind of underlines the fact that in approval voting, you can clearly vote for your favorite. There is some question whether you want to vote for anybody else. Because if you vote for somebody else, your vote might be the one that allows them to beat your favorite. So there is that concern, which is not shared by instant runoff voting. But the problem with instant runoff, as you noted before, is really a worse problem, which is you don't know if you should vote for your favorite because that might cause you to end up with somebody who's way worse than somebody you would settle for. So polling comes into this, and those are just kind of dicey aspects of elections in general. So just wanted to offer that. Bill, before you start, can I take 15, uh, 15 seconds? You did the last time. I no, know, but I'm asking you your you You've interrupted me twice, so I'll, let me go ahead and do it this time. Uh, Berkeley, are you familiar with how Berkeley selected their mayor? Uh, was it a his runoff? Whatever it was, <clears throat> the candidate they got was a milk toast with no leadership capabilities. Uh, it was a real. It was she was everybody's second choice, and she has no skills I in think, leadership. I think she campaigned for, to be everybody's second choice. Yes, <laughs> is Berkeley or Oakland? <laughs> Oakland. Oakland, Oakland, yeah. Oakland. And uh, and my brother just, you know, this this person has no skills at all as a mayor, and Oakland's a tough place to be mayor. And what system did they use there? It was, IRV. It was it's, IRV. It's Thank you. Voting, yes. Okay, and 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 actually, when you said that Ben Carson uh, came out ahead at the uh, uh, Western what? Summit, I took that as a strike against approval voting for the same reason. You have oh, to, I'm oh, sorry. Like somebody that everybody likes, but just has no leadership ability at all. So, Bill. You have to take into consideration the audience, and that's why I made sure I defined the audience. So for this audience, they would like somebody who maybe doesn't have leadership skills. They're more comfortable with him because they know he's not going to do anything bad that will hurt them. That's not our our general voting population, okay? Absolutely. So they are a specific group. Now, Newt Gingrich, on the other hand, is somebody that would do things to help them, okay? But he has high negatives among the general voting population. And when I say general population, that doesn't have the right connotation. But um, you have to judge your audience. Now, if in approval voting, the group votes for a particular person, broadest popular support, if somebody has no leadership skills, maybe I'm in the wrong group. Move out of Oakland. Maybe, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Maybe, maybe if this person now, an instant runoff voter, she won by an, a problem with instant runoff voting, okay? She won by, by mistake. Well, I don't want to say by mistake, but I don't think she, that... She gained the system. She the system allowed itself to be gamed, okay? And I don't think she purposely gamed the system. I think that it just happened that way. <laughs> now, now, maybe she intentionally <laughs> did to get elected, but why do we support it's that a, type of it's bad a strategy action? Right. for winning under IRB. That's, yes. that's correct. Wow. But I don't know the case well enough to know her, to know if she's intelligent enough and, and forthright enough to want to gain the system. But it allows that to happen. We're, we're, we're going to pause. Um, 15 seconds. 15 seconds. What I wanted to say was uh, we are honored here today to have uh, Neil McBurnett, uh, who is uh, cameras aimed at. And uh, he has devoted so much of his life to honest and fair elections, and he deserves a round of applause just for that. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Neil.
And another five seconds is that I don't know if we, we, we will have the time after this to talk about uh, Kenneth Arrow. I don't know if you want to dev devote any time to that. That's up to our guest speakers. Um, with regards to Kenneth Arrow, what I did on one of the pages for the chronology page, third paragraph down, we, we have Arrow's impossibility theorem in 1950. 52. Was it 52? Thank That's you. That's my knowledge. Okay. Um, Duverge's law. Duverge, uh, could you Duverge. please spell that for the people in our audience? D U V E R G E R apostrophe S. Duverger's law is first articulated in 1951, and when I looked for refute, refute, refutations of Arrow's theorem, I found a philosophy person that wrote something in 1991, and also um, Warren Smith with range voting in 2000 and 2008, and then Gaming the Vote is an election book that came in uh, came in in came out in 2008, and and so I I feel that my understanding is with regards to Arrow's theorem is that yes it is applicable when you are discussing ordinal numbers which are order first second third fourth numbers. When you start using a scoring system, a score of 5, a score of 10, then it's not applicable and that when Arrow initially wrote it, his disclaimers specified ordinal numbers and the popular press uh, extrapolated that to all numbers and then um, it took another 30 years, uh, 50 years to tidy it up and the it, approval voting and uh, range voting are not, Arrow's theorem does not apply to them. So back in 1950, that, that area, Arrow was asked, is there a perfect voting system? And his answer was no. And Under he, his, his Conditions. Correct. Under the set of conditions that he prescribed, which in that case had to do with ordinal ranking, which is in order, which is rated, ranking one, two, three, four. Okay? So um, he came up with a number of things in his theorem. Now we need to distinguish between ordinal and cardinal. So ordinal means in order, one, two, three, four. Ranking. Cardinal so is just ranking. So other words for ranking. Correct. Ordinal is ordinal ranking. Is ranking. Cardinal, Cardinal is a sign of score. Rating. Score given a rate. So under ordinal, under his his criteria, which was ordinal, his impossibility theorem was correct. But it is just a theorem. Also, <laughs> theorem. <laughs> I'm sorry that that was funny. <laughs> and it should be yes. Under also under his theorem. Uh, he said that there are certain things you need to look at, certain properties you need to look at to see if a voting system actually can work. One is there's no dictators. One is, one is if every voter prefers candidate A to B, then the outcome should rank, ordinal, rank candidate A above candidate B. Uh, there's independence of uh, irrelevant alternatives. So if A, A and B, the ranking of candidates A and B should not change uh, ranking if, a, if another candidate, um, if voters change their ranking of other candidates but no, do not change their ranking of A and B. So if A, B, and C in a race and people say, well, I like C better than B, but A and B, I like A better than B, it will always change no matter where, whether C is first, second, or third. Does that make sense? This is, why we didn't, this is why we didn't really get into Arrow's theorem. It's a good thing to Google and to look at and to study and to be interested in. But Duverger's law is a law. And when you look at Duverger's law, Duverger was a French math mathematician also in the 50s. Now, not to take anything away from Arrow. You have to look at it in perspective of an ordinal system. 
He won the Nobel Prize for Mathematics in 1972. So he's a very intelligent person. Okay? Neil, you had a question. Well, I just wanted to tie this back into the comment before. I think that uh, it is true that uh, really the broader field is social choice theory. It is impossible to satisfy everybody. It is impossible to even get to the point where everybody would agree what would be the fair outcome of a given set of voters' preferences for candidates. So we can't go to kind of perfection. It's like, oh, I found an election in which the wrong person won, according to my opinion, because um, we'll never try to make any social choices because it can't be done fairly. So I, I think your points are, are good. I, I think Arrow's theorem has been overrated because it doesn't apply to approval voting or rank or, or uh, uh, score uh, range voting, etc. And you know we have to go with the best we can. You bring up an excellent point about group satisfaction. Uh, with the broadest popular support for the highest candidate, that's the one that actually takes the seat, is elected. Uh, there's a concept that geeks like to call Bayesian regret. Okay, so uh, the under group satisfaction is that the most people in the group satisfied with the results. Random winner has, if you just pull straws, okay, that has, that's the simplest and the easiest to pick the winner, but it has the least amount of group satisfaction. And if you go up the list, you get, uh, you go, you look at what's, if you go from top to bottom, simplest to most um, uh, to most difficult, uh, more complex, I want to say. Random choice is very simple, has very little uh, group satisfaction. Instant runoff voting, board accounts, some other alternatives are more complicated but have better group satisfaction. Score voting and approval voting, approval being simpler than score, have much higher group satisfaction or much less Bayesian regret. And I'm not going to get into the details on Bayesian regret. Please Google it. B A S E A N regret. B A Y E. B A, thank you. B -A Absolutely. I had it in my mind, it didn't come out through my mouth. B A Y S E N regret. There's a chart in Gaining the Vote that shows yes. the Bayesian regret. Yes. Uh, anybody else want to talk? Um, I will also offer my uh, criticism of Arrow's theorem, okay? One of the things that, uh, let me see, if I, I think it's, I've got the right slide here, so hold on one second, I'm gonna put it up. One of the things that he um, is big on is uh, rationality. That is, if I, um, if a person approves more, uh, I'm sorry, it's right up there. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, uh, then he asserts that voters will will do the right rational thing and assert that A is greater than C. Unfortunately, human beings don't work that way. Uh, I, I'm seeing uh, Neil smiling here. Do you want to jump in? Oh, okay, so we're talking about irrational water. All right. Okay. So, note, and I, I know that uh, we have some guests here who are not um, libertarians, and one of the arguments that we often, that libertarians and people of our ilk make is that um, people who don't agree with us also don't agree with something called Modus ponens. Anybody here know what modus ponens is? All right. Nobody here stu studied uh, uh, logic. Modus ponens says that if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. Very simple. Um, people on the political left, on the other hand, sometimes, not, not our guests here because we have very rational guests, um, if you say, uh, do you believe that um, if price goes up, supplies go, supply goes down, all other things being equal, cerebrus paribus? Um, yeah, they'll agree with that. 
And do you believe that if wages go up, you'll get less wages because you've driven up uh, the price of wages? If prices go up, demand goes down. Yes. Therefore, you uh, believe that the minimum wage is a bad idea because you're going to get less in the way of uh, supply of labor because the price of labor has gone up. No, I don't agree with that. A implies B, B implies C. Human beings don't always jump that way. So in Arrow's theorem here, we have um, A implies B, but A is bigger than B, and B is b bigger than C. This is a preference. And note the difference between preferences and modus ponens. I, uh, I asked Jim, oh, I'm just picking on you, Jim, sorry. Um, do you, actually I pick on myself. Uh, I prefer uh, Wendy's to McDonald's. I prefer um, Outback to Wendy's. In a rational world, I would always eat at Outback because that's my preference. That would be uh, A is greater than B, B is greater than C. But that's not what people do. Okay? They, I mean, I don't always go to Outback, especially if I prefer it. So, and especially when you have all sorts of um, things uh, to compare, you start getting muddled. That is the. Um, so Arrow's theorem depends on these statements of fact. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bloviating a little bit, but um, actually I'm bloviating a lot, and I apologize to our listeners. Uh, human beings don't necessarily act rationally. Arrow's theorem assumes rationality. And if you ever want to take a look at where arguments break down, always look at the assumptions. And Arrow was very clear about what his assumptions were. He was assuming rationality. People aren't rational. Therefore, Arrow's theorem doesn't necessarily apply. Sorry, and then I will now shut up. And you didn't, blo you didn't bloviate. You were, you're exactly on point. Uh, causality is not always the case because of human beings. So I, I don't know that the, I don't have source for this, but uh, I have heard and read that where they've raised the minimum wage, for example, in San Francisco, people want to work less hours to make the same money so they have more free time. So that's a rational concept for them. But if we look at cause and effect from an economics point of view, raising wages, raising prices, creates, um, uh, what am I trying to say here, creates higher prices and less demand, therefore they won't need them as much. But they, they make the rational choice that I want to be off more. I want to make the money I'm making. I'm fine with that. Anybody else? I'm, I'm just, Frank. in my mind currently, there's for viability and visibility of libertarian ideas, three basic ingredients are needed. One is ballot access, two is debate access, three is an alternative voting method. If you are at all involved with, with any faction other than a mainstream Democrat or mainstream Republican, those three elements are needed in order to change the current voting uh, outcome. And uh, I'm going to come back to here in Colorado. I'm grateful for ballot access. The fact that Blake and I were on the ballot with the approval voting parties evidence that we, in my mind, we are spoiled here in Colorado with regards to ballot access. With regards to debate access, uh, we we then get into the viability and visibility argument that I think can only be changed by uh, a better voting method and approval voting would be that method. So I'll conclude there. My, um, anybody else before I jump in? Okay, then I'll jump in. Um, my memory is shot, 
So somebody refresh my memory. The guy who uh, is the bartender at the Blue Parrot, anybody Paul remember? Weissman. Paul Weissman. No, who's now treasurer, if I remember correctly. Boulder County treasurer. Right. We owe the Libertarian Party, the Greens, uh, owe Paul Weissman a huge amount. Uh, we are indebted to him because he, about 15 to 20 years ago, worked with the Libertarian Party and a coalition of other minor parties to give us ballot access. And so, yes, Frank, we are quite spoiled. So thanks to him, and uh, I'll send him a, a note if I can find him and say that I said thank you. Maybe he won't uh, have the assessor tax me as much. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a good joke. Anyway, um, do we have anything more that we want to say about this, or do we want to wrap up? Uh, I have we've, just got, we've gone for about one and a half hours. I just want to mention a couple of things we haven't touched on. Right now, our current system encourages voter frustration and anger. My guy didn't win. Uh, in a HOA election, why did you vote for her? She's an idiot. Why did you vote for him? He beats his wife. So we get into this factionalization. Did he get more votes? Um, Sorry not, about that. We're not going to go there. Okay. Does, it really doesn't matter who the winner is because it's not about us versus them. It's about all of us. So with approval of voting, I could have voted for him and her, and you could have voted for her and him. And all of a sudden we say, oh, I see you voted for her. She's got some good qualities. And the other person says, oh, I see you voted for him. Yeah, I kind of liked him too. It doesn't matter who won. It's a matter of bringing people together. If you use approval voting to decide where to eat lunch or what movie to go see, it's not that you want to win. It's not that you want to see your movie. What's more important is to go together. It's that simple. If you use approval voting with your spouse or with your significant other, every time you do that, you've added to their life because you've allowed them to truly express themselves on all the possible options, and you choose the option that has the highest, broadest popular support. It's as simple as that. This can be used in many different ways. Legislatures could use, and this is kind of off the deep end, but legislators could actually have five versions of a bill rather than go through this ponying up and try to amend this and amend that and do this. They have five versions of the bill and they vote on all the versions and whichever version has the broadest popular support is the one that wins. It's as simple as that. Um, there was Neil, one. go ahead. Then I'll oh, jump in after you. Let, let me make one last point and then we'll go to Neil. Okay? Um, I don't care if libertarians, I'm going to say this again, I don't care if libertarians or greens or any other alternative party ever wins. But I want to see what they have to say influence future public policy. Approval voting allows that to happen. Neil. Um, I, while we're dealing thanks out, I want to... Um, um, could you say that again? While, uh, while we're, we're dealing out thanks, which is a, a good thing, I, I, I want to first of all thank the Libertarian Party, along with the Democrats and the Republicans and the Green Party, who 12 years ago started a movement to uh, improve election integrity in Colorado and uh, got paper voting machines in Boulder. And that was a joint effort doing the right thing. And I want to report that we have actually made uh, remarkable progress since then. Remarkable when you think about <laughs> how politics usually works. So the Colorado Risk Limiting Audit Project is, uh, has gotten equipment certified for use in Colorado that is the statewide recommended equipment, the Uniform Voting System, which is able to give us more transparency by giving uh, ballot by ballot uh, indications of how people voted, and we're now able to use that to do highly efficient audits of elections. So we can actually uh, sample from uh, all the ballots uh, that use that system and check that sampled uh, set uh, statistically against the results that were published and come up with great evidence as to whether or not the official result is right. Uh, that's a complicated way to say it. Trust me, it's a complicated uh, thing to try to be precise about statistically. But the point is, 
Uh, if we can get the Secretary of State to adopt good rules for how to do risk-limiting audits, which is uh, the law, and we now have the means to do it, and it's going to be required by 2017, we will be able to uh, look at the paper ballots and see if they support the outcome. And I just want to encourage folks to be involved with that and to ask clerks if they're doing the right thing in terms of um, auditing elections properly, because the last thing we want is uh, future allegations, uh, once again, that the actual winner shouldn't have won because something was happening. That's great. So we're doing great stuff in Colorado. Um, so I will jump in, um, Neil, and say that you and I have to go back a long way. Um, her chair. I, were you part of that group that uh, where I recommended the name of the group that pushed for paper ballots? We call the paper tigers. Yeah. Were you there? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. So, well, thank you. Neil. I mean, really, we may not share the same politics, but I we share the same passion for honest elections. And even though. Um, are we done? I think we're done.